Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We want to continue our series on Blessed Are Those this morning. And I don't know about you, but I've learned some things during this, the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are special because when we look at the things Jesus said to his disciples, we find the depth of understanding that he was trying to teach the twelve. You need to understand that Jesus taught, taught the multitudes, but he also taught the disciples. I believe what he taught the multitudes is very important for us to grab hold of and use. But what he taught privately to the disciples is what we need to learn to live in the blessing. See, I believe he taught them because he needed them to go teach that, teach that individually, not in the multitudes. See, there's some things you can do in settings like this, but there's some things that you need to do settings on one-on-one -on -one in, in a Sunday school class. And, and that's, where, that's where today's church, when we don't have Sunday school anymore and we don't at Elevate but we miss that opportunity to be able to, to drop some nuggets in people's lives to teach you how to live blessed and, and you need to understand that not all, all the 12 would receive it but all of them had the opportunity Do you see today there's a lot of people in this room today and, and today there's a lot of people that have the opportunity to receive it but not very many people will receive it do you understand the difference See, some of, some of you, if you'll receive it, you'll understand and you'll walk in the blessings of God and you'll see where God wants to use you and bless you in it. In the, in the Beatitudes, we find that Jesus is teaching on how, his disciples on how to be blessed. It's important to understand how to walk in his blessings. See, you can, you can, if you tell me how to do something, that's fine, but that doesn't mean I'm going to comprehend it. Come on. See, listen. I love that our church is multicultural. I love that, that the majority of our church is Hispanic. And of the, of the Hispanics in here, you, most of you speak a lot of, of, of Spanish. You speak two languages. And, and some of you are like, Pastor when are you going to learn Spanish? I barely learn English. <laughs> and, and I have people all the time, they'll tell me a word. Say this, and you roll your, R, my t you roll your tongue. And my tongue don't roll that way. I'm white. I say everything with a draw. Pastor Sarah, she's always correcting me on how to say tortillas. And I know tortillas is not correct, but you have to say it somewhat different. I'm not going to say it because you'll make fun of me. But I'm just white. No, I'm not going to say it. Quit antagonizing me. I'm getting bullied right here on the front row. My security team just sits there, does nothing about it. They should be escorted out and flogged. Amen. But all of a sudden, we understand, so someone can tell me how to say something in Spanish doesn't mean that I have that, that the comprehension to be able to do it. But I, I just want to tell you today, if you'll comprehend what God wants to do, everyone in this room can comprehend what God wants to do in your life. If you'll just apply it to your life, you can walk into the blessings of God. See, his blessings doesn't mean that no hard times are coming. It just means that in hard times, we still know who God is. Can I tell you that it doesn't matter what the tragedy may be. It doesn't matter what the experience may be. We still know that God sits on the throne. As a believer today, we need to be, have our foundation in the word of God. And that way when hard times come, we're not shaken. That we stand in faith and understand and know that he is still God. As long as we understand that who God is, then we'll always know that he is still Jehovah Jireh. He is still the Lord, our provider. He is still the one that will always provide. See, some of the times you need to learn to take the pressure off of you and say, God, you are the God. You are the one that spoke the word. You are the one that's called me into this. And Lord, I trust you in this in Jesus' name. And just about every day I'm asked for advice. I get asked a lot of questions and a lot of people ask me for advice. And almost 100% of the time I give one answer in regards to making decisions. I will tell you to follow peace. If you come up to me with a decision to make and you have option A or option B and if you're wanting me to, to give you A or B, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to ask you to follow peace. Once you learn to follow peace, you'll never learn to follow the unrest of the complications of being outside of where you're called to be. We need to understand today that peace rules and we need to learn to trust God in the peace that he has given us. Peace is like love. Peace never fails. See, when you have peace, you can be in the worst moment in your life and still be okay. Isaiah 53 and 5, we, we quote it a lot for healing, but I want you to look at it. It says, 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He is bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are what? Healed. We, we quote that last line a lot. Leave that scripture up there. It said, and by his stripes, we are healed. But go back to the third line. It says, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. In other words, that the peace that God gives us, that peace that passes all understanding that God gives us, he has already been criticized for having peace. Has, have you ever had peace about a situation and people say, I can't believe you're not upset and they're almost criticizing you? Don't take that as criticized. Christ already took it for you that you're walking in his peace. You understand who he is in you and now you can walk into peace in a hard time. We've got too many people that lose peace too quick. His peace changes us. He received the turmoil so that we could walk in peace during our turmoil. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, and peace I give to you. Not as this world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, this world doesn't want us to have God's peace. This world wants you to live in a, in a stress. and God. Uh, this world wants you to live in a pain, in a turmoil, and chaos. That's what this world is, is after for you to be in because they under, this world knows as long as you're in chaos, you'll never be in the blessings of where God wants you to be. That's why Jesus is teaching the disciples to walk in such a peace that it would change their life forever. So now we have the choice to follow God's peace. That's why the enemy uses people close to, to you to hinder your peace. Have you ever noticed it's the people closest to you that will remind you how bad something is? That's why your mama doesn't need to know everything. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. Oh, you're not going to make it through that. You better shut your mouth. Jesus is on my side. Listen. See, some of you just need to remember who's on your side. If the Lord is for you, who could be against you? Come on now. We need to understand what the word of God says. Listen, that's why some of you, some of you need to get off Facebook and stop talking about all your problems on Facebook and getting sympathy. Could you imagine every time I got upset with Pastor Sarah, I'd get on Facebook and talk about how the, the, the wife needs to support her husband and do all those things. Could you imagine what kind of mess I'd get myself into? But yet, people do it all the time. Because you're looking for sympathy. And you're looking for attention. And God says, stop looking for those things and walk in peace. What I've learned is when I walk in peace, I'm not going to get attention. I'm going to get peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I love peace. Matter of fact, if you want to disrupt my peace, I'm going to disrupt our relationship. Because it, peace is that special to me. Listen, if you, how many of you know drama mamas? Or drama daddies, for that matter. Does anybody know anybody that just, just walks around and they look like, what was that, that on Charlie Brown? What was that, Pigpen? Or what, what was his name? They had the dust walk around him? Pigpen? Yeah. Yeah, you walk around and you just got drama, 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 drama. And you turn around and there's still drama. Boy, I got bleach for them, praise the Lord. I will erase you. Act like you never existed. The cancel culture will come to the Riley household and I will cancel you, praise the Lord. Why? Because peace is important. Because what I've understood about Christ is if I'm walking in the realms of where God wants me to be at, then that peace is going to be there with me. And I allow people to come in and steal my peace. Have you ever not liked your place of work? Don't raise your hand. Your boss might be here. <laughs> but all of a sudden, you don't like your place of work, and all of a sudden, you allow your work to steal your peace. Do you understand the word allow? 
See, because you allow that to happen. You should raise up a standard in your life that says, I'm not going to allow that to come into my life. I refuse. I put a barrier around me. I put a barrier around my family, and the peace of God is going to be with me. I don't care what you say or how you say it. Listen, some of your exes are just nothing but drama, and all they want to do is steal your peace. But, baby, I'm not going to let them steal my peace. I know who God is in my life. I'm going to walk in the peace of God. I don't need drama. I, I let them go a long time ago. I just have peace. This weekend I was coaching Jace's basketball team and I don't know why I do this to myself because it, it kind of sometimes interferes with my peace. And yesterday something happened to me that I'm glad that you weren't there because you would attack the referee. It was the first game of the morning. Apparently, he's not a morning person. Within 45 seconds, I got my first technical. <laughs> Don't judge me. I didn't do nothing to deserve it. I just told him it was a foul. And he blew his whistle and yelled at me. And told me to be quiet. And to sit down. Now listen, if you're new to Elevate, you may not know who your pastor is. But I, I am rebellious to the core. And all of a sudden, this man is just staring at me. And all I could do is stare back at him. And I'm sitting there thinking, he is going to try to steal my peace. And so I sat down on the chair like I was supposed to, like a good little student. I sat down on my chair. And so I'm starting to talk to the other official because apparently this official is in a bad mood. So I said, I didn't even do nothing. I just said it was a foul. He th they threw our kid to the floor. It was a foul. And now this official sees me talking to this guy, and he flips him and so he could run my bench the whole game to hear if I said one word, and he said he's going to kick me out of the game. Now, the devil is a liar. <laughs> Listen. Now, I could have done one of two things. I could have stayed mad at him or I, and, and let him steal my peace, or I could remember who I am. I'm a child of God. I wasn't a preacher at that time. I was a coach, so don't judge me. I'm a child of God still, and he's not going to steal my peace. And so all of a sudden, I just kept my mouth quiet. And, he, and I know some of you think that that can't happen, but for about 35 minutes, I kept my mouth quiet. And I, he'd just run up and down the bench, run up and down the bench. And then about about second half, then he tried to beat my friend. The devil's still a liar. You ain't going to stab me and then try to be my friend. And what you have to understand is situations like that could have ruined your whole day. Do you understand that situations like that ruin people's days and weeks and months? There's something so simple that shouldn't, that shouldn't ruin anything, but all of a sudden now, now we've been ruined because all of a sudden we've allowed someone to steal our peace. So for the last seven weeks we've been doing the Beatitudes. I just want to review those real quick. He, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about being humble, being teachable, and, being, and share Jesus. We, he said, blessed are those who mourn. We talked about weeping brings resurrection, weeping brings joy, and weeping ends in heaven. <clears throat> the third week we talked about blessed are the meek. <clears throat> humble, be humble, be gentle, and, and to wait. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we talked about to, being, uh, to be filled, we, to have desire and to be righteous. Uh, he talked about uh, blessed are the merciful. And we talked about being patient with people's quirks. We talked about giving people a second chance. And we said, do good to those who hurt you and to be kind to those who offend you. And last week we talked about blessed are the pure in heart, to seek God in private, spiritually search themselves, and to be a witness. And today we're going to go to the ninth verse of Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, we see this scripture used a lot that we honor our police officers with it because they're peacemakers. And, and we said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And here at Elevate Church, we have men and women that are, that are officers, and we thank God for them. And I'm I just going to go ahead and say this right now. 
that we completely back and support at Elevate Church, we completely back and support our police officers. I, I don't believe you should defund the police. I think you should fund the, the police. Because, see, you shouldn't be paid the pennies that they're paid to put your life on the line. Listen, my brother's a cop. I understand how much they don't get paid. I understand that. Listen, I think he's crazy. I, and if you're an officer, I think you're crazy. Because your life is never going to be the same because of the things you're going to see, the mental anguish that they go through, the things that they see, the things that they have to rescue people, and all you hear about is 1% of the problems that, that we want to put on social media and blast on people. No, no, no. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. I think our police officers are wonderful people, and they are serving our community, and we back the, the Midland Police Department, the Odessa Police Department, Ector County Sheriff's Department, Midland County Sheriff's Department, our DPS officers, we support them all. Why? Because they're good people. So the next time you get pulled over, you should ask them if they go to Elevate and if they don't, invite them to church. But you might find someone that does and they might just give you grace. Or they'll write you a ticket and you're going to take it. And say, thank you. Thank you for ruining my day. But thank you. God bless you. But that scripture is not just for them. It's for you. So there's three things this morning I want to talk about to be a peacemaker. Number one, to be a peacemaker, we must control our anxiety. To be a peacemaker, we must control our anxiety. Philippians chapter number four, verse six says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Verse 9. The things which you've learned and received and have heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, all of a sudden, we see, we see that, that, that he said, be anxious for nothing. And then at the very end, he said, the God of peace will be with you. The problem that we have in, in, in society today is we diagnose everything and we medicate everything. We medicate what we need to surrender. See, anxiety is a real thing. But anxiety doesn't have to be treated with medication. Now, I understand if you're here today and you're on anxiety medicine, listen, I'm not, I'm not preaching at you. I'm just trying to teach you a spiritual thing. See, that's why, they, that's why the Word of God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is medicine. But we need to wrestle against the principalities in darkness, which is spirit. And when you understand what anxiety is, it's the enemy's foothold in your life that will try to wrestle you down and steal all your joy and mainly steal your peace. Because all of a sudden we start, putting, we start putting expectations onto our life that we can't ever be fulfilled with because all of a sudden we now and then we have anxiety and says, I can't get through this. When God said, no, let me be God and you be you and I'll give you my peace. See, we have to get back to the point of saying, God, you're still God and I trust you. God, you're still God and I believe in you. God, I know that things are, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills this month, but Lord, I have peace with you. See, there are so many people walking around still with such a panic because of the coronavirus, and I understand it's a real thing. I understand it's a real virus, but listen, the flu's a real thing, and we don't act this way. Hello. We don't act this way. And now you're seeing other countries around the world starting to come out, and they're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's like the flu. And we need to understand that there are some things that, this, that, that our government will put on us to try to get us to react one way, and we have done it. And we, what we have done is we've walked right out of peace and right into anxiety to now we're afraid to shake people's hands. And the one thing that we've understand that how God created our bodies is physical touch is a very important thing in, how, in life and how love is in our life. Some of you just need to learn to just learn to be nice and touch each other nicely. And now we can't see people and now you can't shake hands and don't dare hug, oh my Lord. And you better not kiss your spouse or they've been outside the house for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> well, baby, if my wife's going to die, I'm going to die with her. Listen, listen, I made a deal with her. I have to die first because I ain't living without her. That's truth because... 
Do we still got kids at home? <laughs> Come back in six years, let's see what my answer is going to be. I still couldn't live without her, right? I'd be a mess without her. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, look what, this, what, look what society has done. Listen, right now, right now, there are more divorces going on. And couples, they thought their marriage was fine. But then it, when, in the pandemic, they had to spend time with each other. And they learned that they really didn't like each other. And now they're getting divorced. Listen, all it's done is says, I'm going to take you out of peace. I'm going to put you into anxiety. And how are you going to react in anxiety? See, I believe turmoil comes. I believe tragedy comes into our life. I believe God allows some of these things to happen because just like the song says, the longer I wait, the longer I'm going to praise you. The problem is, is we don't have faith to praise him longer because we have walked away from the teachings of Jesus and we've walked away in the teachings of books because people will teach you how to do this. See, I make people mad when I talk about books, but I'm so sick of books. Well, I read this book one time, and it told me if I did this, this, and this, it would clear me up. Well, now you acted crazy. Listen, I'm trying to tell you something. We have overeducated our people to where now we just believe anything that's written on paper. But yet we have a hard time believing the Word of God that will change your life and, and teach you to walk in peace. And if you would ever just grab hold of the Word of God and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you more than I trust Dr. So-and-so. And more than anything else, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Oh, I understand psychology. I understand all those things. But I also understand the spiritual aspect of the Word of God. And the Word of God will not return void. And as long as I stand in the Word of God, I'll always walk in His peace. I don't have to walk in anxiety. I can walk in His peace. But this world teaches you to be wrapped up and be anxious about everything. And Jesus said, be anxious about nothing. But Pastor Shelton, you don't understand my storm. No, I understand your storm, but you're allowing your storm to become your God. See, whatever you, whatever you put prefaces on, whatever you, whatever you put as your priority, that is your God. And all of a sudden, he's saying, be anxious about nothing, and the God of peace will take you Listen, we need to understand that God of peace, he gives us the peace that passes all understanding. He will teach us the ways that, that, that no man knows, and he will walk us through this. There are battles that I've walked into my life. I didn't know how I was going to get out of them, but I understood one thing. If I, if I died, I was going to be with Jesus. If I live, I'm still going to be with Jesus. The fact is, I'm going to be with Jesus. The problem in the church in America, we are one, we are one tragedy away of losing people in the church because you'll lose faith in God. Because you have more faith in men than you do in God. Let me tell you, I ain't your God. I will never be your God. I will not die for you, but he did. And therefore, when I have situations come into my life, I'm not going to allow the world to put anxiety on me. I'm going to trust God that he's going to walk with me through it, and I'm going to have peace all the way through it. That's why people can look at you and say, I don't know how you made it through it. I can tell you how I made it through it. I made it through it by the grace of God and his peace that passes all understanding. That's how I made it through. So when you feel anxious, you need to praise God. Listen, quit posting. I love it when people put on Facebook, prayers please, no questions. What kind of questions you get asked? Listen, see, sometimes what we do, we, we do God such an injustice because we look for the attention and not for the intercessor. See, I have intercessors in my life. If I have a prayer request, I don't have to put it on Facebook. See, your circle should have people that pray. Maybe the problem, with, maybe the reason your circle is broken because you don't have nobody that prays in it. Come on now. And so we need to get to a position in our life to where we have people around us that I can call them and say, hey, bro, I've got a problem and this is it and I'm, I'm, I need someone to, to join me in prayer over the situation and I know that they're going to pray. Because you know what on Facebook? People put praying or they put praying hands. They ain't praying. I need people that's going to bombard heaven. 
See, that's what you need in your life. And there's people that can, will do that for you. The second thing that we need to learn to be a peacemaker is to stop looking for a fight. Stop looking for a fight. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 18 says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now listen, I'm about to make some people upset. But some of you need to get out of your feelings. You looking for a reason to fight. I call you little bobcats. You look all cute until someone sets you off in it. Because what I've learned is people love to be offended. Do you understand the difference between offense and offended? See, offense means, see, I'm, I am an offensive person. I can't offend you. I know I've offended many of you. The key is this, whether you want to walk in being offended or not. See, if I offend you, that's my fault. But if you walk in the offense, that's your fault. And we have a generation and society today that's walking around with chips on our shoulder that are as big as this building and just looking for someone to upset me so that, that, that I could be mad. Some of you drive pre-road rage. Listen, we talk about this a lot. Midland has the worst traffic and a lot of times in restaurants, some of the worst service. Okay? That's just what we know. Those are two given, they're factual. But, why would you go to a restaurant expecting to have timely service in Midland, Texas? Because you most likely are not going to receive it. It's kind of like when a waiter, if you're a waiter or waitress, will you please relax the anxiety off my wife? When you come up to our table to receive our order, please write it down. I understand you learn memory lessons. And I understand you can memorize everything from here to there. But you're going to mess it up. And all of a sudden, see, but, but, but we get so mad. Why couldn't they just write it down? Why couldn't you just make your order simple? <laughs> and all of a sudden, we're just looking for a fight. And the Bible says that we are to walk around trying to make peace with everybody, but we're trying to fight everybody. We're trying, we trying to wrestle against what we shouldn't be wrestling with and we try to go against the things that we should be trying to make peace with because Jesus was a person of peace. Every time that people would bring people to Jesus, that he would walk in peace with them. The only time Jesus ever got mad was with religious people. And see, if you want to get mad with religious people, they're just looking for a reason to be mad at you anyways. Religious people get mad about the dumbest things. Religious people will leave the church for the dumbest things. The dumbest things. I can't believe they paint that wall purple. What? See, we have to understand that God has a purpose for everything in your life and you need to learn to quit fighting with things that God's trying to bring into your life. A few years ago, before Elevate Church, when I preach, it doesn't matter where I preach at, whatever venue it is, and I've preached at some large venues, but I, I try to make eye contact with everybody in the service. So I always just try to make eye contact as I'm preaching. That's why I walk around as much as I do. A lot of it's ADD, but I tell you, I'm trying to look around and, and, and try to find people, and, and I try to just make eye contact with everybody, and, and so that's what I'm trying to do. All right, I think I got everybody by now, praise the Lord. But we try to make eye contact. And there's a guy that uh, he, he thought I was preaching at him because I looked at him. And, of course, he did it the great Christian way. He didn't come talk to me. He wouldn't talk to one of our board members. And that's the most scriptural thing to do because it's called gossip. 
But the board member and I were really good friends, so he calls me, and he said, my board member friend, he's passed away and went to heaven. He's one of the few board members that probably make heaven, but <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> kind of. And he calls me, he said, hey, pastor, he said, uh, so-and-so uh, said that you were preaching at him on Sunday, and they're leaving the church because you looked at him. If I'd have known that, I'd have looked at him a lot sooner. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm sitting there thinking, what in the world? And so he said, I don't know what you want to do about it. I said, no, if you're going to get that, listen, if you're going to get your feelings hurt that easy and you want to leave go to another church, there's like 18 billion churches in Midland. New church starts every weekend. Church closed down every weekend. You can find a church that will make you feel happy and make you feel comfortable. But I'm an offensive person because I'm going to look at you and make eye contact with you. Is there anybody here we don't like? I'll look at him. <laughs> and so sure enough, sure enough, he leave the church. In a couple of weeks, I don't see him. But we're in a small town, 20,000 people. You see people. When you live in a small town, you just you see people all the time. I'm walking through Walmart. And sure enough, there they were. And you know what I did? I said, <laughs> how you doing? Good to see you. Isn't that crazy? Listen, isn't that crazy? Now everyone's afraid to make eye contact with me because we're afraid I'm going to want to kick you out of the church. But what is, is called the spirit of offense. And we're looking to fight for everything. When Jesus said that we need to find peace with everything. Do you understand what the world teaches you? The world teaches you to stay in a constant life. A battle. A fight. And Jesus is always telling you to find peace with each other. And we have to learn to walk in that peace because that's what God is longing for us. You see, I just truly believe if the church in America would learn to walk in peace, we would have a mass revival that would break out across the country and spread around the world because we've learned to walk in peace instead of trying to fight with each other. I've had people leave the church because someone sat in their seat and I didn't want to do nothing about it. My, my suggestion was get there earlier. The response was, we can't get there any earlier. We're always 15 minutes late. Well, that's your own fault. <laughs> Show up 15 minutes late at Elevate Church, you're going to park down the street. And you need to understand that. And we have to learn to walk in the peace of God because God's tired of his people fighting amongst each other and he's trying to teach the world that if we would just walk in peace and do as the best that we can to walk in peace with each other and stop fighting against each other, then God would do some amazing things. The third thing is walk in peace. Romans 8 and 28 says, We know all the things work together for the good to the loves of God to those who are called according to his purpose. Now let's talk about this for just a moment. Because see, that tells me that everything that happens in my life, God can turn around for his glory. So that means tragedy could take place and his glory still could be found. Listen to me. That means that the hardest times in your life could be you could go through and God's still going to find glory through it. Why? Because when we surrender everything to God and walk in his peace and stop fighting against it and we just say, God, I, I, I choose today to walk in your word, to walk in your peace, to walk in your presence. I, no longer am I going to have the weapons of the enemy fight against me like they are right now. I'm going to walk with the shield of peace around my life because I refuse to give in to the enemy. Today I am a child of God. I am blessed and highly favored. There, there, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm going to speak the word of God over my life. And I'm not just going to speak it, but I'm going to walk it. Why? Because he has called me to walk through some difficult storms. But through everything, difficult storms, he'll turn it for his good. Well, Pastor Sheldon, how, how could that ever turn? How could that turn to be good? Has shown how could anything good? Well, maybe it led you to here. Maybe it took, maybe it positioned you to get in contact into a situation to where now it's shifted your life to now you can see God in it. Maybe you maybe you stuck in Midland. I hear that all the time. Moved to Midland to make a bunch of money, and now you're stuck here. 
And I hear people all the time, man, as soon as I could move from Midland, I'm moving out. We got executive pastors. They couldn't wait to move here. <laughs> now, listen, they're only five days into it. We'll talk to them next week, evaluate the situation. <laughs> but the fact is, everybody has to go through a journey of difficult times. That's why the psalmist David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's not a good time. It's a hard time. But he also knew that God was with him and that God was going to comfort him, that God was going to walk with him in the hardest times of his life and now he understands and knows that I am who I am today because God turned the bad into his good so that we could receive glory together. See, you can be mad at your ex all that you want, but there was a reason why God allowed that to happen into your life. And now watch him turn it for his glory when you learn to walk in his peace because when we walk in his peace, he changes everything. It's just peace. That's what God does. That's why he said, blessed are, are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Whew. You want to be a sons of God? Be a peacemaker. Some of you need to some of you need to offer an olive branch to the people that, that keep on attacking you or maybe you've been attacking them. And learn to walk into the word of God and say, today I'm not going to fight no more. Pastor Sarah and I, a couple of years ago, we went to Portland, Oregon. Now you have to understand, Portland, Oregon is a, is a beautiful city, but they have tons of issues. And... Some of their issues is, is uh, they have a, an increasingly um, problem with weed, with pot, that everybody there just smokes it. When, I first, when we got there, our Uber, we had an Uber driver, and he said, how do you guys like Portland so, so, so far? And Sarah said, oh, I love it. It's so peaceful, so relaxing. People are just so wonderful. And he looked at me and said, how do you like it? I said, well, I'm a little uptight. Like, I don't relax real easy. So everybody here just being chill kind of irritates me. <laughs> and he said, well, you just need to relax. I'm like, it's hard to relax. You go, listen, in Portland, Oregon, you go to a four-way stop, there ain't nobody going because they're all saying, you go, come on. You go, come on. You go, come on. <laughs> I rented me a car to show them I can go on first. <laughs> but I'm not kidding. Isn't that right, babe? They just sit there, come on. And I'm sitting there looking at my Uber driver like, dude, just go. <laughs> like they're, but they're just being polite to each other. Just come on. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I'm on a time crunch. We got to go. I'm, I'm still on Midland time where we got to hurry up. <laughs> and they're all like, chill, dude. When a driver found out that I was uptight, he, you know what he told me? He said, listen, he said, sir, he said, I, I tell you what, I want you to have a great time in Portland. He said, so every corner you could find these, they're little gummy bears. <laughs> and he said, he said, just get you a package of those gummy bears and just eat one. And if you still feel real uptight, eat another one. <laughs> That's what he said. Isn't that right? That's exactly what he said. I'm sitting there thinking, this guy is telling me to, to eat weed or whatever. <laughs> And I'm just like, what the world? Like, what kind of crazy place has my wife brought me to, right? <laughs> it's her fault. She picked it. And all of a sudden, but see, some of us, we need to learn a little bit of Christian philosophy behind a worldly principle. That some of us, you, you just need to learn to chill. See, life's not always about you. Let me say it to this side over here, because this side over here didn't like that. See, see, life isn't always about you. Life is about God using you for his kingdom and for his glory. We don't always understand everything that happens in our life or why it happens. We just have to trust that all things, see, all things, Pastor John, I don't think I'll ever recover. Shut up. All things. 
that I have the peace of God walking with me. So when I walk through a situation I don't understand how it's going to turn out or I don't see any good in it, God still has a plan for my life. God still has peace in my life. I'm still going to walk. I'm still a child of God. I'm still blessed and highly favored. I understand I don't know how the bills are going to get paid, but I also trust and know that he is still the Lord. He's still Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. I understand that I've been hurt. I understand that I am lame today, but he's still the healer. I understand today that it doesn't look like I'm going to make it, but my God said if I would trust him, I could believe in him, I can have faith in him I'm going to make it back, listen to me you can take my car, you can take my home you can take everything that I have as long as I have faith, I'll be back and as long as I have peace, I'll have faith we need to learn to be peacemakers in the house of God watch what God can do, somebody give God a praise in the house of God that's free, this first service didn't get that Because we have to have peace. Listen. I, a few years ago, it was last, it was last year, Pastor Jim Ray, I was spending some time with him. And we were just talking. I was talking about some things I was going with. He gave me the best, best advice. Best advice. He said, stop scrolling. See, social media will cause nightmares. Listen, because you think everyone's talking about you. Lights are bright. Are you awake back there? My peace is so important, you stop scrolling. You know what's funny? I stopped scrolling, and then people started complaining I didn't like the post. If they're going to be that easily offended, let them be offended. My peace is more important. See, let me, I'm going to help you. My peace is more important than my relationship. If you want that easy, if you're going to be that easily offended, you weren't a friend anyway. You were a user. Some of you need to learn who your users are. They just suck the life out of you. But he's the peacemaker today. I thank God for peacemakers. Will you stand to your feet? There's something about the peace of God that changes everything. Changes everything. Last year, January of 2020, I remember we had New Year's and my mom, right after Christmas, the day after Christmas, they put my mom in the hospital. It wasn't the first time in the hospital. Back when mom first got cancer, I would jump on a plane real quick and head to Houston as fast as I possibly could. If there wasn't a flight, I would drive through the night just to get there. But after six years of mom and mom going to the hospital and there's, I don't know, I lost count how many times my mom had went to the hospital. I remember getting a text on the day after Christmas. On Christmas, dad would text me, pray for mom, she's not feeling good, she's not doing well, she's not eating. She's throwing up everything that she's eating day after Christmas my dad said hey Sheldon I just want you to know mom's in the hospital or I'm on the way to take mom to the hospital we've got to figure something out we waited and we waited we waited trying to figure out what's going on New Year's happened on New Year's Day she's still in the hospital she'd been in the hospital at that time for quite a while and Dad said, Sheldon, she's just getting worse. I told Sarah, I said, I thank God for a supportive wife and a supportive church body. But she, she said, get to your mom. I got on a plane, flew there, and I walked into the room. Before I walked into the room, my dad stopped me and he said, now Sheldon, he said, I want you to know your mom doesn't look the same way that you saw her last her eyes are sunken in she's just a skeleton of herself that was their brain cancer that we didn't know that she, the doctors didn't even know that she had brain cancer at the time the tumor sitting on the base of her stem I said okay 
He said, she's not talking. She can't really talk. She can't eat. She's just dying right before us, and we just don't know why. Have you ever felt helpless? It's pretty helpless. I walked in the room. I grabbed my mama's hand. She couldn't talk, but I remember she just took her lips and she just made, she formed the words, peace, peace. One of her favorite songs is this old chorus called Peace, Peace. I remember that we sang that. I sang that for her. She just sat there. Matter of fact, you couldn't really, there was no life in her eyes. It was just a couple days that would go on that me and my brother would have a conversation that something with her brain is not right. And the doctors came in and we took them out to the hallway and I said, man, there has to be something wrong with her brain. Have you scanned her brain? They said, no, we've scanned every part of her body but that. They said, we'll do that tonight. That was on a Saturday. I'll never forget. Flew home Saturday night, late Saturday night so I could be at church on Sunday. I would wake up to my dad calling me about 5 o'clock in the morning. They just got back from doing a, the CAT scan on my mom's brain to find the tumor on the base of her brain. I preached that Sunday here. Gathered my family. We got on an airplane. Not thinking we'd see my mom maybe ever again. They did surgery. I thank God Sarah was there with me. The doctor said it would take two hours or longer, 45 minutes. The doctor came out, said, We got everything. She's in recovery. And one month later, the song that she word to me to sing we would find ourselves at the top floor of MD Anderson Hospital. We'd wheel her wheelchair up to the grand piano there on the top floor. She would put her fingers on the keys of that piano and she'd begin to play Peace, Peace. It was there that me and my mom would sing Peace, Peace together. I don't know about you, but something about God's peace just makes me feel whole. <laughs> 